The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you a regular listener to this program? then you've undoubtedly noticed that the commercial messages from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, always treat you like an intelligent human being. Tonight, for example, the Equitable Society is going to talk about educating your children to lead more successful lives. We'll then outline a simple, workable, low-cost plan to help you do exactly that. A plan that will appeal to every thoughtful father or mother. If you have ambition for your children... You'll welcome this informing message from the Equitable Society coming in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Aged Apprentice. Many people labor under the mistaken impression that a single crime not involving loss of life is relatively unimportant. It is true that no single person could possibly find time to concern himself with each of the million seven hundred thousand major crimes committed in this country in the past year. That, however, does not negate the fact that each of those many crimes was important. Important not only to every law enforcement agency, but also to every person living anywhere in the nation. Perhaps the best way of proving that statement is by analogy. The number of waves washing onto a beach in a day is almost beyond count. They wash ashore and run out to sea again. And even by watching closely, it is impossible for the naked eye to see any difference in the shoreline. Yet each wave wears away an infinitesimal part of what it touches. No beach is washed away in a moment or by a single wave. But because it does ultimately disappear, every wave was important, for each helped in the job of destruction. Similarly, it is improbable that any single crime will ever destroy our fundamental respect for law and order. But such a day might conceivably come if the waves of crime continue to wash over the land. This is not to say there is no hope of defeating our army of criminals. The point is that by hard work, we can make that defeat more than a mere hope. But it will take action to bring victory. Action on the part of every decent American. Tonight's file opens late one afternoon in a Midwestern city. An elderly woman stands behind the counter in a printing shop and watches a well-dressed couple enter the store. Good afternoon. Hiya. Can I help you? This Ernie Guthrie's place? That's right. Uh, we like to see him. Oh, he's out right now. Uh, when do you expect him back? Well, not for a couple of hours. Oh, my name's Caldwell. Chuck Watkins wrote to him about me. Oh, of course, we got the letter yesterday. I'm Mrs. Guthrie. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad to know you. This is Mrs. Caldwell. <laughs> How do you do? Hello. <laughs> if you'll excuse me, I think it might be wiser if I lock the front door. Sure, that's it. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry that Ernest is out. He was very anxious to meet you. I must say, you look just like your picture. Oh, you've seen my picture? Oh, yes, many times in the post office. Oh. Now, what can I do for you, Mr. Caldwell? Well, uh, we understand that you handle specialized printing orders. That's right. I'll show you a few samples if you'd like. Samples? All right. Now, where's that scrapbook? Oh, here we are. It's a good thing Ernest is out. He doesn't like me to do this. <laughs> <laughs> he says it's showing off. <laughs> but he does do such fine work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, here are some football tickets he did last year. Mm. <laughs> yes, the man who had them printed wrote us a wonderful testimonial. Well, he said these tickets were so good that over 200 of the legitimate ticket holders were thrown right out of the stadium. Yeah, that a fact. Yeah, well, they look pretty good. But we're not in the market for tickets. <laughs> yes. Well, here are some diplomas that Ernest did. Uh, look, Mrs. Guthrie, <laughs> what we're interested in is stocks. Oh? some samples of those. Yes, right here. Oil stocks, municipal bonds. Uh, what type of security were you interested in? A gold mine. And it's got to look good. We're building up a real smart chump. Oh, I understand. Well, you'll want the deluxe job. Hmm? Yeah? What's that? Gold seal, red ribbons, and the governor's signature. Oh, that sounds good. Any particular governor? No, you tell your husband to just pick one out. You print me 5,000 shares and deliver them tomorrow to the Hotel Broadway. Meanwhile, at an FBI field office a few hundred miles away, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Andy Parker. Hello, Andy. Oh, hi, Jim. You have been looking for me? Yeah, we just drew another one to work on. Oh? Swindle this time. What's the deal? man who called himself Bentley went to a local broker's office. After he established a legitimate position, he asked the broker to handle a negotiation for him. A uh, stock negotiation? Yeah. He asked him to contact another man here in town. Said this man had some oil stock that he was interested in. I see. He gave the broker $20,000 and asked him to buy the stock for him. He also said the stock might cost a little more and asked the broker to lay out the difference. I think I know what's coming. The owner of the stock was a confederate. That's right, Andy. <laughs> The victim made the contact. The Confederate held out for 30000 and the victim laid out an additional 10000 His own money. Yeah. And the two swindlers disappeared. That's right. Any leads? Well, the police arrested Bentley's Confederate this morning. Has he talked? Oh, no, not yet. Found a card in his pocket with a phone number of the Hotel Central on it. I contacted the hotel, learned that Bentley and his wife had been registered, but just checked out. Oh, no, fine. Andy, did you ever hear of a con man called the Fox? Uh, vaguely. Well, his real name's Fred Caldwell. Now, from the descriptions we've gotten, I have a feeling that he's Bentley. I'm waiting for confirmation now. From who? From Washington. Uh -huh. We got some of Bentley's fingerprints from a drinking glass that was in the victim's office. Oh, uh, Andy, you working on a report? Yeah. Yeah, just cleaning up a case. Well, then you can wait here for a word on the prints, huh? Well, where are you going? Back to the Hotel Central. See if I can get a lead on where the swindlers have gone. <laughs> Yeah? Right. In here. Well, baby, we're all set to make the money move. I just left the chump, and he's ripe and ready. Has the stock been delivered yet? Nope. Well, what goes? I told the old dame to have it here. You may not be needing it. Why not? Can't work the swindle without a front man, can you? We got a front man. You had a front man. Hmm? What do you mean? His wife just called. He's gone on a bender. Oh, no, no, no. Wait, are you kidding? No, I am not. I'm not surprised either. I knew when you took that guy on that he looked like a lush. All right, Ruth, you don't have to knock whiskey. Fred, isn't this thing serious to you? Of course it is. Then what are we going to do? Well, let me think. You can't just dig another front man from left field. We've got to get a guy who looks legitimate, acts legitimate. I know, I know. <sighs> Answer that, will you? Just a minute. Mrs. Caldwell? That's right. Right, Mr. Guthrie. Who? Ernest Guthrie. I have those stock certificates you ordered. Oh, yeah. Come on in. <clears throat> Thank you. Really? Who's that? Mr. Guthrie. He's delivering the stock. Oh, oh, well. Hello there, Mr. Guthrie. How do you do, sir? Here are the certificates. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks. I uh, worked all night on them. Put a few extra little touches in you might like. Uh, uh, just take a look at the scroll work under the seal there. Yeah. I... Say, Ruth. What? Wait a minute. What about him? Huh? Look at him. Gray hair, dignified puss, nice front. Could be. Sure he could. Are you talking about me? Yeah. Say, Mr. Guthrie, did you ever do any freelance work? Uh, what do you mean? Ever fronted a touch, worked a stock shake? No. Then you're going to right now. Well, but Mr. Caldwell, I never did anything like that. Sit down, my dear Mr. Guthrie, and have a drink. Oh, no. Then have a cigar. We're about to become partners. <laughs> Is that you, Ernest? 
Yes, yes, dear. Goodness, where have you been all morning? There have been three customers here waiting for you, and I kept saying you'd be right back. And I, uh, I was delayed. Where, at Mr. Caldwell? Yes. Is anything wrong? No, no, no. Well, then what in the world uh, Lydia, uh, please, uh, let me sit down. Uh, oh, uh, my head is still spinning. You've been smoking again. Well, uh, that isn't the reason why I have to sit down. I... Oh, I just have to assemble myself. What are you talking about? <sighs> well, first of all, I, I'm now Mr. Caldwell's partner. Partner? Oh, goodness, you must have smoked a lot. No, 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 it, it, it's true, Lydia. I, he wants me to work with him. Doing what? Well, he, uh, he has something all planned. Uh, he, he explained it to me. I, I don't remember it too well, uh, all I know is I, I wear my blue suit, I, I sit in an office, and hold out for thirty thousand dollars. Anything back from my dent, Andy? Yeah, Bentley turned out to be Caldwell. All right. I was pretty sure of that. I just finished sending out an alarm. Did you go to the Hotel Central? Yeah, I interviewed the doorman. He remembered the Caldwells. They had their own car. Could he describe it? Oh, not well. He just remembered that it was a black sedan. Had no idea where they went? No, none at all. Well, did you check the hotel garage? Yeah, but they didn't keep their car there. The police are contacting all the other garages in the neighborhood for us. Uh -huh. Well, we have Caldwell's complete record here. I didn't wire it. Hmm? Is that it there? Yeah. Runs three full pages. I just finished reading it. Hmm? He's going to be rough to catch, Jim. He seldom uses the same swindle more than twice, which means that you... No, pardon me, I'll get it. Sure. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Taylor. This is Lieutenant Bard, headquarters. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. We located the garage that Caldwell used. It's at 111 Oak Street. Will you wait till I write that down? Surely. 111 Oak Street. Is that right? Right. Thanks a lot, Lieutenant. You're welcome. Andy, the police have located the garage that Caldwell used. I'm going to get right over there. Ruthie? Yeah? Say, uh, old man Guthrie call yet? No. Hmm, that's funny. Anders went to see him an hour ago. I hope the old guy got to the office. He did. How do you know? His wife just called. <laughs> it was kind of cute. Cute? What do you mean? Big thank you for launching the guy on a new career. Seems he's always had an ambition to... I'll get it. Hello? Mr. Caldwell? Yes? Yeah? Uh, this is Ernest Guthrie. Oh, well, hi, Pop. Anything happen? Mr. Andrews was just here. Well? We discussed money matters for quite some time. Almost an hour, in fact. Well, what'd you get him up to? 30,000. Well, good boy. Did he lay it on the line? No. Then uh, what's the deal? He's delivering it here tonight. That's fine, Pop, fine. Uh, Mr. Caldwell? Yeah? I, um... Uh, I want you to know I... Very much enjoyed doing this job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Swell, swell. Yes, I, uh, I like it much better than the printing business. You do, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm trying to say, Mr. Caldwell, uh, if uh, you think that I've handled myself properly... Oh, marvelous, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, would you uh, consider continuing this relationship? Sure, sure, why not? Do you mean that? Why, yes. Oh, that, that, that's wonderful. Uh, excuse me, I, I better call and tell Lydia... Go right ahead. Yeah, you call her. See you tonight. <clears throat> well, Ruthie, everything's in line. Did the chump pay off? Tonight. Start packing, honey, and as soon as we collect, we'll call the cops, tell them where to pick up old Guthrie, and we'll be on our way. <laughs> Now a special message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society to fathers and mothers of young children. About 10 or 15 years from now, that youngster of yours is going to be saying to you... Hey, Dad, the letter came today, accepting my application for college. Your boy or girl will have three good reasons for feeling elated. First, college men and women earn more money. Look, Dad, 
Here's a magazine article which proves that college men earn $72,000 more during their working years than the fellow who doesn't go beyond high school. Second, college men land the bigger jobs. See, Dad, it, it says that out of every 16 men earning $10,000 a year or more, 15 are guys who've been to college. 15 out of 16. Third, college men get more out of life. Learn to appreciate art and good books and music. Gain culture they wouldn't trade for any amount of money. So don't leave your children's education to chance. Be sure. Be certain. Start an equitable education fund now. An equitable education fund? Uh, what's that? It's the painless way to pay for your children's college education. In this Equitable Society's plan, you start when your children are young. Then, each year, you pay a sum of money that doesn't hurt an amount that scarcely makes a dent in your budget. When your youngster's ready for college, the money's all ready for him. That's spreading the cost of education over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a beating in four. Right. Now, suppose the father dies or becomes totally disabled. Then no more payments are necessary. The fund becomes fully established. When the youngster is ready for college, he gets the same education as if his dad had lived. So don't delay a day longer. Let your Equitable Society representative show you how little it costs to start an Equitable Education Fund or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. -E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Aged Apprentice. One of the subjects constantly occupying the sociologists of our nation is crime. Why does a family, for instance, breed one decent law-abiding citizen and one homicidal criminal? What is the single factor in the background of each that made one conform to the rules of society and one decide to break them? Obviously, it is not a matter of inheritance, since both have a common heritage. Nor could it be entirely a matter of environment. For college professors have been raised in squalid slums that also gave the world a John Dillinger. It is impossible to write any general set of rules by which the background of a person might be measured. Any such set of rules would be as false as the bromide handed from generation to generation about there being such a thing as honor among thieves. You need no more proof of the fallacy of that statement than tonight's case. Nor is this one any exception Instead, it follows the criminal pattern. In one case, for instance, an apprehended fugitive turned state's evidence. His testimony brought a long term of imprisonment to his accomplice, who happened also to be his brother. Lest it sound like such a lack of brotherly devotion set a new record, the files of any law enforcement agency can produce many similar accounts. Because there is no such thing as the average criminal, it is impossible to tell you every characteristic of every lawbreaker. However, devotion and honor are qualities seldom found among them. Greed is the common denominator of the criminal who regards with compassion and complete sympathy only one person in the world, himself. Tonight's file continues at the FBI field office. Hi, Jim. Oh, hi, Andy. Well, what's with the map? I'm just checking off some gas stations. Have you got a lead? No, not exactly. I talked to an attendant at the garage where Caldwell kept his car. When he pulled out, he asked for a map. The attendant didn't have one, and Caldwell said, well, he'd take one up on the road. Did he say where he was going? No, but they said his gas tank was almost empty, so he must have stopped for a map at a service station reasonably close to town. Uh -huh. Have you tried to contact any of them? Well, the state police are working on that angle for us. I interviewed Caldwell's confederate, but unfortunately it didn't lead anyplace. He didn't know where Caldwell had gone. Huh? No. Message from Teletype, Mr. Taylor. Oh, thanks, George. It's from the state police, Andy. Mm hmm Yeah, here we are. One night last week, Caldwell stopped at a gas station on Route 30. Did he pick up a map? Yep, and he also asked for directions. To where? Grove City. Come on, Andy, let's get over there. <laughs> Yes, who is it? It's Lydia. Oh, come in, come in. 
Well, this is a surprise. Ernest. Did you come to see the office? Ernest, eh? has he been here yet? Eh? Who? Mr. Caldwell. Oh, no, no. And I've arrived in time. Oh, Lydia, what are you talking about? I've just heard some very distressing news, Ernest, about Mr. Caldwell. Oh, well, what is it? One of the Miller boys came into the shop. I told him about you, who you were working with, mm -hmm. and he just threw up his hands in horror. <sighs> Why? He's known Mr. Caldwell for years. He told me that whenever he does a job, he engages a confederate. When the job is over, he calls the police and has the confederate arrested. No. That's undoubtedly what he plans to do with you. Why, Aunt Lydia, I, I can't believe it. Uh, Mr. Caldwell about wouldn't do this that. this man? Huh? The one who's to pay you the money? Well, I, I expect him here any minute. And how much is he bringing? $30,000. Ernest, I think we should teach Mr. Caldwell a lesson. You mean... Uh, yes. The whole 30,000? Yes. Oh, that'd be very risky. He'd find us, and I think he'd find the means to get the money back. But he intends to double-cross you. Mm, well, I, I can avoid that by leaving here right now. And leave $30,000. Lydia... If I were a young man, I'd be willing, even eager, to teach Mr. Colwell a lesson. Ernest, but you I... just wait here. Where are you going, Lydia? I've thought of a way to get that money. No, no, Lydia. Ernest, there's a moral point involved. We have a chance to prove to Mr. Caldwell once and for all that being dishonest just does not pay. Sign coming up on the right, Jim. Catch it, will you, Andy? Uh huh. Should be the outskirts of Grove City. Yeah, yeah, it is. Oh, we made good time. Andy, you ever been here? No. Our police headquarters is just a few miles down on the right hand side. Uh huh. How do you want to work? Well, I know the town, Andy, so you better stay at headquarters and take the phone detail, huh? All right. Call every garage in town, will you? See if you can locate Caldwell's car. Okay. I'll distribute the pictures and cover all the leading hotels. How many are there? Oh, half a dozen or so. If I come up with anything, I'll call you. Hello? Andy, Jim Taylor. Oh, yeah, Jim. I'm at the Brown Hotel. I just missed the Caldwells. What happened? They checked out of here a half an hour ago. You located their car? No. Well, I think you better come right over here. Andy. Oh. Uh, get anything, Jim? No, not yet. What have you covered? Well, I've interviewed the manager, bellboys, room clerks. They don't know where the Caldwells went. They might have wired ahead someplace for reservations. Yeah, there's a telegraph office in the corner. All right, I'll go on down there. Okay. I'll go interview the switchboard girls and check the telephone slips. See you back here in the lobby. Any luck, Andy? No, how about you? No, oh, I drew a blank, too. They didn't make any calls. Not from their room. The elevator man said Caldwell used a payphone here in the lobby. Well, I guess we'd better go back to police headquarters. Yeah, we might as well. Hey, wait a minute. What? I'm going to go back and talk to the switchboard girls again. Where have you been? Over to see old Tom Morgan. Tom? What for? To get a check for $30,000. You can give it to Mr. Caldwell. But, Liddy, he, he told me not to take a check. This one is certified. It's one you printed for old Tom. Oh. Did the man come here with the money? Yes, he just left. Uh, let me have it. Liddy, I, I think... Give it to me, Ernest. Very well. Uh, I'll just put it in here with my knitting. Here. You take the check. All right. Uh, oh. Hi, Pappy. Well, I didn't expect to see you here, Mrs. Guthrie. <laughs> I was just curious to see how Ernest looked seated behind a desk. <laughs> Did Andrews come here? Yes. To give you the dough? Uh, yes, I uh, have the check right here. Check? I told you to take cash. Well, the check is certified, Mr. Caldwell. Oh, well, that's different. Fred? Fred? Is that you, Ruth? Yes. Well, they're still here. Huh? Good. Did he give you the dough he collected? Yeah. How? Certified check. It's a phony. Yeah. What? I just got a call from Tom Morgan. The old dame here got that check from him and filled in your name. 
He had a beef against her, so when she left, he called me. That's thoroughly dishonorable. Fred, they're trying to hand you one. Now make them come up with the cash. Colwood, I, I don't know what she's talking about. Well, I do. Andrews paid you in cash, and you tried to pull a switch. Where's the dog? Ernest, I've heard enough of this. I'm getting out of here. Oh, no, you're not. Fred, let's frisk him. No. Just a minute. Come here, Pop. No, no, no. You no, keep no. away from me. Hey, stop. Yes. Stand where you are, all of you. Uh -huh. Oh, thank heaven. I'll take the money you've been discussing, and you can have these. What is this? They're warrants for your arrest. Oh. Fred Caldwell and his wife were convicted in federal court of violating the National Stolen Property Act and sentenced to serve 10-year terms. Ernest and Lydia Guthrie were also convicted on the same charge and sentenced for the same number of years. Special Agent Taylor, knowing it was impossible to trace a call from a pay station telephone, was about to give up on that angle when he realized there might be some records which would aid in locating Fred Caldwell. Those were the carbon copies of messages Caldwell received at the hotel. Three messages had been left for him by a Mr. Andrews. By thorough but rapid investigation, the right one was located. The Andrews who had been victimized after answering Caldwell's elaborate prospectus. He gave the two special agents the address of an office in another state where the swindle had taken place the office at which the addresses were made. And so another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation was closed. But in a sense, it has not been closed, for there are still men like Fred Caldwell at large in many parts of this nation. Neither your FBI nor any law enforcement agency can put a halt to their depredations, for they do not hear about it until after the crime has been committed. However, these men need not continue to be successful, for you can stop them. You, the American people, by refusing to accept anything for nothing, and thus by refusing to be victimized. Now, one last word to fathers and mothers. Of all the things you can do for your children, there's no greater proof of your love for them than an equitable education fund. They'll be grateful for it as long as they live. Your boy or girl may only say a few words like... Thanks, Mom. Thank you, Dad. But you know from the look in his eye and the ring in his voice that he'll never forget your foresight in starting an equitable education fund. Right now, make that wise resolution to see your equitable representative soon. <laughs> Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A factual account of the operations of a big city racketeer. Its subject, kidnapping. Its title, The Vanishing Witness. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Tom Brown, Walter Catlett, Tony Hughes, Bill Johnstone, Florence Lake, and Peggy Weber. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Vanishing Witness on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of the Thin Man. Fun and excitement for the whole family when the Thin Man comes your way. <laughs>